sometimes people ask me questions like, have I studied the neurons in a transformer's residual stream or the neurons uh, in the value vectors? And I think this isn't quite the right way to think about it. I think it's it doesn't really make sense to go um, and, and even, yeah, I think that question just, just doesn't really make sense. And so I wanted to sort of lay out uh, why that seems to be, why that's the way things seem to me. And the heart of it is a distinction I'm going to make between what I'll call a privileged basis and a non-privileged basis. And the idea here is that sometimes a neural network representation has a special basis um, that is particularly meaningful to study, and sometimes it doesn't. And that really changes how we have to approach interoperability. And so even though a lot of my work has involved studying neurons, um, you can only really do that uh, when you have a privileged basis, because usually what it means to me to have a neuron is, is that the neuron uh, is, is the, the, uh, the value of a vector on a particular privileged basis. So um, a privileged basis is usually created by having a nonlinearity in a neural network, especially ReLU. Um, ReLU, uh, because it's, it's such a sharp nonlinearity, um, and because it, it creates sparsity, uh, it tends to be especially good at aligning meaningful features with the basis dimensions of your representation. But uh, you can also end up uh, with a privileged basis uh, if you have perhaps some, some regularizer that's enforcing sparsity uh, in, your, in the resulting activations. Um, so you could have a, a linear transformation, but if you were regularizing the output, you might have a privileged basis. Um, or uh, if, your, if your weights maybe had uh, like some kind of L1 sparsity on them, that might create it. Uh, so there, there are other ways that you can get a privileged basis, but the most common reason would be that you have a nonlinearity, um, and especially a strong nonlinear function. Now, uh, when you do that, the result is that you're, you're incentivizing features to align with that basis. And um, an example of, of why you might think that's the case. So yeah, why, why is it that, um, that we're going to have features align with the basis? Well, if you, if you go and you, uh, if, you imagine, if you imagine having a representation that's trying to encode two features and, and you have two ReLU neurons to do that, um, one way you could do it is you could align the features with the, with the, the ReLU activations, or you could go and do something like have one be the average of the features, one neuron have the, be the average of the features, and one be the difference. Well, if you do that, the point at which uh, the features transition from firing to not firing in, in each case is, a, is dependent on the other variable. And so uh, if you try to recover the variables afterwards, that's going to inject a lot of noise. And that, that's going to really incentivize you to go and align things with the basis. So yeah, when we have, a, um, when we have that kind of privileged basis that encourages features to align, um, then we'll call the basis dimensions neurons. But usually we, we won't call them neurons, um, uh, or at least I usually don't call them neurons uh, if they don't have that. So for instance, if you have a word embedding where, where you don't have a privileged basis, um, I usually don't think of the, the basis dimensions there as being neurons. Okay. Now, on the other hand, a non-privileged basis uh, forms, uh, it's sort of the default thing. So if you don't have a nonlinearity um, or some kind of regularization, you should expect to not have a privileged basis. And that means that you shouldn't expect looking at some dimension of that to be any really any different from looking at a random projection or at least a, a, a random unitary uh, projection. Your base of your representation. So yeah, why why should we care about this? It, you know, you might say, well, okay, that's that you're sort of making this distinction. Why does it matter? Well, it matters because one of the best tools we have for understanding neural network representations is to have a meaningful basis that breaks it down and where we can study each component independently. Uh, really, any neural network representation is going to have an enormous amount of volume. Um, it's, you know, as you increase the number of dimensions, you, you obviously, the, the crest dimensionality sets in and you have just exponentially much volume potentially in that representation if you wanted, wanted to try and study it. And so the key way, the key thing that goes and saves us from the crest dimensionality and allows us to understand um, the entirety potentially of a neural networks representation is gonna, if we, if we have a basis where we can study every dimension independently. And uh, the easiest way to go and get a basis where you can study things independently
would be if you have uh, a interpretable basis for free from your from your model um, because uh, it comes with a privileged basis. So we are very, very fortunate um, if we have a privileged basis because it makes things a lot more interpretable, or at least a lot more easily interpretable. Okay. Um, so in transformers, uh, where what which parts are have a uh, a privileged basis and which parts don't? Well, uh, the MLP neurons have a privileged basis. So uh, if you're familiar with the, the transformer architecture, um, every block you have um, attention layers and you have MLP neurons that both branch off from the residual stream. And the MLP neurons are going to have a gel U or a ReLU activation on, function on them. And so that's going to cause them um, to be, have a privileged basis. They're actually, um, they're also higher dimensional than your residual stream. So that's going to be actually an extra thing. Um, like if there's polysemanticity going on, that's going to make them extra nice. Um, and so MLP neurons, uh, at least in theory, all the theory, theory points towards them uh, being great. Now, in practice, if you look at our, I think probably the next video we'll discuss them a little bit, they might be, so far they've been pretty tr tricky to under, understand in my experience. But um, in theory, they definitely have a privileged basis. And uh, in theory, they seem like they should, a lot of things point in the direction of them being very nice. Another one that we often don't think of, um, but I think actually uh, is, 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 I guess it's the most privileged basis in some sense, is the, the tokens. Because we, we often represent tokens as one hot vectors. Um, both when we input them and then when we output them and we have our logits or our softmax, we have probability distribution over tokens. And um, every dimension in that basis uh, is completely interpretable because, you know, they just correspond to uh, these tokens that are in our writing system that are basically designed, well, at least the writing system is designed for us to understand it. So that's definitely a privileged basis and um, very different from a random projection of that space. Now, another one um, that it's easy to sort of forget about is attention patterns. So uh, for a given pair of tokens, uh, you have your dot product of the key and the query, which is the score. And then after you apply a softmax across the tokens, you get a probability distribution. And because those are, are one dimensional in some sense, they're, you know, they're the, the pattern, of course, the distribution is multidimensional across tokens, but it's, there's only one dimension per token. Um, that really, uh, encourages you to have, even, even for the scores before the nonlinearity, to have a privileged basis, or at least, I mean, I guess if you only have one dimension, sort of, you're, you're a privileged basis by default, and then um, softmax is very nonlinear, so that's also going to encourage, um, encourage in some ways you'd have a privileged basis. Um, on the other hand, uh, the residual stream, so from the moment you do your first token embedding, you take your tokens and you multiply them by a matrix or look up a vector. Um, there is nothing about that uh, that is privileging uh, any, any dimension in that operation. And uh, when you go and you add things into your residual stream at every step in your model, you add the outputs of the MLPs, you, you down project your neuron activations and, and add them to the into the residual stream. Or if you go and you take the outputs of your attention heads and project them into the residual stream and add them in, all of that is just, you know, it's, it, it's an, you could potentially do an arbitrary linear transformation and get the same result. So your residual stream is not going to be privileged. It is not a privileged basis. Um, yeah, in, in the default transformer architecture. Now, uh, there might be some exotic transformer architectures where you do have, um, where you might have a nonlinearity in your residual stream. Uh, and I guess one way in which maybe there's a very slight effect is um, you might have layer norms on your residual stream, which uh, uh, may privilege because you're, you're multiplying by a, a sort of by a diagonal matrix that might slightly privilege um, your, your base extension of your residual stream, but it's, it's essentially just uh, in, in almost all cases, not going to be a privileged basis. Another place where you don't have a privileged, privileged basis um, is going to be your keys and your queries and your value vectors. So your attention head produces these keys and queries and values by going and uh, doing a matrix multiply of your residual stream. And then you, you dot product the keys and queries together. Um, so there's, there's nothing about that that's basis dependent. And so definitely you shouldn't expect your keys and queries to go and be uh, privileged. And your values, you're just going to do a linear combination of values and multiply them by another matrix. So there's nothing about the value vectors either that's going to encourage them to have uh, a, 
a special basis. And so uh, you shouldn't expect to have a privileged basis for any of those. Now, uh, it's worth talking about this and maybe in the context of other types of neural networks. So um, in RNNs, uh, your RNN state and your LSTM state is generally privileged. Um, you probably have uh, a, uh, some kind of nonlinear activation function, whether, regardless of whether you have an RNN or an LSTEM or um, a GRU or uh, any of these things, you, you probably have a privileged basis. But your, your word embedding um, is basically the canonical example of not having a privileged basis. So for a word embedding, it just doesn't make sense to go and ask, you know, what does basis zero mean? Um, like, um, yeah, if I, in, in just in the default basis that it gives you, or uh, what is what is the basis direction one uh, mean? There's there's nothing special about those basis dimensions. And that doesn't mean that you can't study the word embedding. People study word embeddings all the time, but you can't do it by just um, looking at the basis dimensions. Um, now in confidence, we mostly see uh, architectures where essentially everything is privileged um, because we, we mostly have neurons, especially neurons with ReLU activation functions, um, which is really going to encourage uh, a privileged basis. But we do sometimes see um, the residual stream. Yeah, so in, in ResNets, um, many ResNet architectures will have ReLUs on the residual stream, which does cause them to have uh, a privileged basis, but sometimes you won't have values on your residual stream, in which case um, they will, will not have a privileged basis. Um, there's also uh, some other sort of rare situations where you may not have a privileged basis um, in a continent. So uh, one case might be uh, if you have, uh, sometimes you might go and do uh, a low rank matrix factorization um, of your weights. I'm forgetting that I think there's a name that people sometimes use for this um, in the in the context of content. It's slipping my mind for a second because some some special name people sometimes use. But um, where basically you'll do two convolutions in a row, one that's doing spatial and one that's doing um, sort of depth wise convolutions, um, and then you'll apply your activation function. And so if you look at the activation between those two steps, um, uh, depending on the details of it, it may not have a privileged basis because it's uh, uh, you you didn't have uh, an activation function. It'll, it'll depend very much on the, on the details of exactly how you factor those matrices. Um, but that might be another case where you, where you possibly might not have a privileged basis in the confidence. Um, but that kind of situation is very rare. So um, this usually doesn't come up in confidence. Usually in confidence, um, um, except for the, the resonance that don't have values on them, um, you have privileged basis everywhere. OK, so uh, the final question is, what should we do when we don't have a privileged basis. So in, in transformers, actually, a pretty large fraction of the transformer doesn't have a privileged basis for us to try and work in. We have to go and somehow work around that. And there's broadly two category of things you can try to do. So you can either try to find a meaningful basis for that representation, and we'll, I'll talk through a few options in a second, or you can try to push analysis to other representations in the model and not work, just try to ignore and not work with the representations that don't have a privileged basis. So uh, in the case of not of, of trying to find a privileged basis, one thing that's been very successful, um, especially in the word embedding context, is to define, um, define a new basis in terms of differences between elements. So uh, people very often will like define a gender dimension by doing man minus woman um, or something like that. And then you'll go and you'll uh, project things onto that, those dimensions. Um, you might also apply various dimensionality reduction techniques like PCA. Um, uh, PCA or ICA or things like that seem um, really, I think, if you want to do this, you want to do some kind of linear non dimensionality reduction. Probably some nonlinear dimensionality reduction probably isn't very principled to do here. But you could, you could do something like PCA and study that um, and study those dimensions. And um, that seems also to make a lot of sense. Another option um, is that you could, and this is, this is pretty similar. Um, is you would try to factorize things. Um, and well, I guess the intuition here uh, is a little bit tied up with another idea, which is that uh, neural network representations seem to often, there's this ph phenomenon of polysemanticity where you have even, even representations which have a privileged basis. Um, often you'll find neurons that seem to correspond to multiple things. And 
um, we call these polysemantic neurons. And I think the leading theory um, among the small set of people I know who talk about this for, for why this is the case is that uh, there's, the network is trying to represent too many features. And so it's forced to go and squeeze multiple features into neurons and take advantage of the properties of high dimensional spaces and the fact that uh, in a high dimensional space, um, many, you can have exponentially many almost orthogonal dimensions. Uh, in any case, all, all of this is to say that um, if you believe that, you, you want tools potentially to go um, and pull apart that a, a space into actually a higher number of dimensions um, to find a meaningful basis. And so then, then there's some ideas around factorization um, and sparse coding and things like this um, that are, are potentially really, uh, really powerful. Um, and yeah, sparse factorizations um, that seem, seem promising. Okay, so in any case, um, that's, that's my rant on the uh, trying to find a meaningful basis option. For the trying to push analysis to other representations, well, in the case of transformers, we're very, very fortunate that all of these representations that don't have a privileged basis are just, they're just linear transformations of a bunch of privileged basises. And so the alternative thing that you can do uh, is you can just try to go and talk about everything in terms of uh, privileged bases like your MLPs and your tokens um, and just push all the math back to those. And uh, I think actually, I mean, if you've watched our, our videos um, so far, you've probably seen some examples of this implicitly uh, where we were able to go and understand, for instance, um, attention heads by going and pushing the OV circuits and QK circuits all the way back to uh, the tokens. So uh, yeah, this is a, another strategy that you can take, and I think it's a very, a very, very promising one and a very nice one. Okay, so uh, in any case, that's my rant on privileged versus uh, non-privileged bases or uh, representations that have a privileged basis versus representations that don't have a privileged basis. And uh, yeah, if you're interested in our, our next video, I think we'll actually, I'll go and have a couple of my colleagues join me and we'll talk about um, some neurons we find in transformers, um, of course, in the MLPs, uh, where that sort of is a, a question that uh, seems like a good question to ask. Thanks.